Greetings, motherfuckers, and welcome to this week's insane edition <laughs> of 101 Facts. My name's Sam, and today we're here to talk about everybody's favourite box-smashing marsupial with a huge face and a surprisingly tiny waist comparatively, Crash Bandicoot. The Wumba Fruit Munching Gem Nicking Hero. He's an icon of gaming, so it's a pleasure to finally have you, Crash. It's about time. But why did Crash originally not talk at all? What are some of the frankly bizarre secrets of Dr. Neocortex's past? And who's careless enough to leave all of these boxes all over the place? They've got some good stuff in there. Anyway, two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so prepare to leap through a portal into a cartoonish world of puns and mayhem with a nice heady dose of nostalgia, with 101 facts about Crash Bandicoot. Number 1. Crash Bandicoot is not a horrifying daytime TV item on marsupial abuse, but it is a video game series of platformers originally developed by Naughty Dog, the company, not just a badly behaved hound. The latest games are now published by Activision and are no longer PlayStation exclusives. Number 2. So where did Crash come from? Well, he was birthed by childhood friends Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin, that's a horrible image, sorry, who founded Naughty Dog together in 1984. Number 3. Gavin and Rubin wanted to make a platformer like the 16-bit era of games, like Donkey Kong Country, Mario and Sonic, but make it 3D. As a player, a lot of the time you're seeing him from behind, so the game was jokingly codenamed Sonic's Arse Game. Ugh, someone's probably made that literally online somewhere, haven't- oh. Number 4. But Crash wasn't Naughty Dog's first game. Before that, they'd made a few others, including Way of the Warrior for Universal Interactive, which was scored by Rob Zombie? Sure. Well, Universal liked it so much that the Naughty Dog gang was signed to make three additional games for the company, and I don't want to give away what they were, but I'm going to talk about them a bit more in this video. Just saying. Number 5. After the success of Crash, Gavin and Rubin went on to make the game series Jack and Daxter before selling Naughty Dog to Sony. During their time at ND, they made 14 games, which together have sold over 35 million units and generated over $1 billion in revenue. Not half bad, lads. Number 6. But anyway, back to Crash. The first Crash Bandicoot game came out in 1996. The second, Cortex Strikes Back, came out in 97, and Warped came out in 98. All were influenced by traditional platformers with new upgrades and new features with every release. Number 7. But Crash didn't just stand his feet, oh no. In 1999, one of the best racers ever was released, Crash Team Racing. Ah. It was pretty much a clone of the lame Mario Kart, just joking Mario, but way better with a naughty's attitude. It was also the last Naughty Dog Crash game. Number 8. The aim of the game is perfectly simple. Much like Bandicoots do in the real world, Crash loves running through a variety of different areas, collecting Wumpa fruit and crystals as he goes, even fighting the occasional boss. Yes, just like Bandicoots do in the real world. Attenborough should really do a documentary on them. Number 9. These are jolly varied though, as in several levels Crash needs to ride things, including jet skis, motorbikes and other animals. Not like that. Number 10. Now, that fabled crystal, which has become a main collectible in most of the Crash games, was introduced in Crash 2 as a way of showing that the level was complete, so when players saw it, they knew they were nearing the climax of a stage. Number 11. Now, to get all Hank Schrader on your bottoms, the crystals are probably based on the real-life amethyst crystals, judging purely by their shape and colour. Number 12. Now, the voice of Crash isn't actually a real Bandicoot at all, but is actually a chap called Brendan O'Brien. Confusingly though, Brendan O'Brien is the voice of Crash in the first, second and third game, and he is in Crash Team Racing, but not as Crash, while O'Brien voices other characters like Pinstripe and Engine. Number 13. If you recognise his voice from recent pop culture, by the way, that's because he's in the team hit Smash Riverdale, where he was a math teacher. Hmm. Number 14. Clancy Brown was the voice of Cortex and Uka Uka from the second game, with his wonderful baritone voice. If you recognise him, he wasn't in Riverdale as a math teacher, but he is the voice of Mr. Krabs and Surtur in Thor Ragnarok. Number 13. Eventually, Clancy Brown stopped voicing Neo Cortex, which, by the way, is a pun on the part of a brain, you know, Neo Cortex, and he was taken over by Lex Lang, who explained at Phoenix Comic Con in 2013 that he needed to change the performance of Cortex because parents were writing in saying he was too mean, almost like he's a villain of some kind. So after that, he became more flamboyant and slapstick. Number 16. The now iconic crates that are dotted all over the levels actually didn't appear in-game until late into development. The stages were considered too easy without them, so they added them in for a little more difficulty. Number 17. The game's soundtrack was put together by the company Mutato Musica, run by Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo fame. That's why the soundtrack is so great. 
Mother's Ball has also scored many movies and projects since then, including, yes, Thor Ragnarok. Small wild day. Eh? Number 18. Naughty Dog's relationship with Mother's Bar and Mutato Musica would remain pleasant, with them not only continuing to work together for the rest of their Crash games, but also teaming up again for the Jack and Daxter series. Number 19. Before Crash and before the days with Universal Interactive Studios, Naughty Dog had a project in mind for a game called AI Osaurus and Dynstein. This frankly incredible sounding title would have been about dinosaur and scientist hybrids that travelled through time. Sure, okay. Number 20. Now they didn't have time to do this fully, not with Crash coming along, but this could be why dinosaurs and time travel feature so prominently throughout the series. Yeah, bet you didn't think about that before, eh? Number 21. In the early stages of the first game's production, the team considered a wombat or a potteroo, which is a type of animal, I'm not just saying potato weirdly, before choosing a bandicoot. Gavin and Reuven even went with Willy the Wombat as a temporary name for the Siren character, but felt it was too dorky. Also, Willy means something else here. <laughs> Number 22, ooh, ooh. Dr. Neo Cortex was created by Gavin and Rubin and other members of the team while eating some food described as mediocre Italian near Universal Interactive Studios. Gavin visualised an evil genius villain with a big head, and Rubin was thinking of a more evil version of Brain from Pinky and the Brain fame. Number 23. Naughty Dog used Vertex animation, which sounds a bit like Vortex, doesn't it? But actually, it's a 3D tool that is effective for creating more expressive facial features. It was inspired by Looney Tunes, apparently. Number 24. Now, Crash came well, uh, crashing, <laughs> to Sony's PlayStation, but believe it or not, it wasn't the only option for consoles out there. I know, right? There were others, like Sega Saturn or the Atari Jaguar, but Naughty Dog thought they weren't good enough. They also noted that PlayStation didn't have a mascot yet. Number 25. They approached Sony for a developer agreement, which they said, yeah, sure, probably, and allowed Naughty Dog to buy a development unit from them for $35,000, after which a budget was set for them of $1.7 million. Number 26. Universal Interactive and Naughty Dog had a little bit of a fight when it came to the game, though. According to Jason Rubin, Universal apparently tried to stop the misbehaving hounds from going to E3 to reveal the game. Also, leaked versions of the box art also apparently had no Naughty Dog logo on them by mistake. Oh dear. Number 27. In response, Rubin drafted and printed 1,000 copies of a leaflet called Naughty Dog, creator and developer of Crash Bandicoot, to hand out in front of the Crash Bandicoot display at the Electronic Entertainment Expo. He also passed out the flyers for review to Universal Interactive, which angered its president immensely. Number 28. Despite all this kerfuffle, the game went on to sell over 6 million units, making it the 8th best-selling PlayStation game of all time and the highest selling ranked on sales in the United States. Number 29. To prepare for the presentation to Sony's Japanese division, Gavin spent a month studying anime and manga, reading English language books on the subject, watching Japanese films and observing competitive characters in video games. Guy was prepped, what can I say? Number 30. Although Sony's CEO at the time, Ken Kutaragi, was heralded for making PlayStation what it is today, he was absolutely not a fan of Crash and the Gang. Kutaragi apparently despised the character and the original Crash Bandicoot game, even going so far as to have a full-on row with a Naughty Dog representative over the game's core design. Oh dear. Number 31. Reportedly, Ken wanted the PS1 to stick out from the family-friendly crowd of Super Mario, and Crash didn't fit that vision. Thankfully though, Naughty Dog stuck to their guns, and now Crash has a whole 101 made about him, the lucky pup. Number 32. As mentioned before, the game's camera is, like Sir mix lots greatest hit, focused on the behind. Naughty Dog thought this could cause a problem, you can't really connect too much with the character whose face you can't see. That's why some aspects of the stages, or even entire levels, like the bolder ones, were added, so you can look into those terrified eyes. Number 33. Crash's primary feature, really, is his absolutely massive face and lack of neck. Why on earth did that happen? Well, back in the ancient times of 1996, graphics weren't as sophisticated as they are now in the age of Fall Guys. Naughty Dog, therefore, wanted players to be able to see Crash's expressions no matter what TV they were playing on, which is why he's so proportionally challenged. Number 34. Now, real bandicoots are brown, but Crash is orange. Apparently that's because Naughty Dog wanted to find a colour for their main character that would make them pop out from the already vibrant environments. So they went with orange and avoided using lava initially so that Crash wouldn't blend in. Number 35. 
Ever wonder what happened to Crash's girlfriend, Torna, who's frankly bizarrely proportioned in comparison to Crash? I mean, how does that even work? Anyway, based on model Pamela Anderson, and much like I am on Tinder, she was deemed too sexy, so she was axed for the rest of the series. Instead, we got the wholesome Coco Bandicoot for subsequent games. Number 36. Debbie Derryberry, voice actress for Coco and a woman with a name I can't believe is real, is also the voice of Jimmy Neutron, who is also a bit of a child genius too. Number 37. Also, in case you were wondering, by the way, Wampa Fruit is fictional. Sorry, apparently it's a hybrid between an apple and a mango. Like a maple or an ango. Number 38. Here's a bit of trickery for you. The Wampa Fruit may look 3D, but they're actually not 3D objects in the game at all. They're little animated 2D sprites that always face the camera when they spin, making them look 3D. Number 39. Speaking of animated, by the way, there were very, very, very early discussions about turning Crash into an animated show. In fact, some animations were even created to examine the possibility before it was decided that 3D animation was to be focused on instead. Number 4T. Now, I don't know if you remember, but Crash 1 was hard. Really, really hard. And the creators knew this too. Even they conceded that the level Slippery Climb was incredibly difficult. Originally, there was an even harder version of this called Stormy Ascent, but it was so, so difficult, they actually got rid of it completely. Number 41. It was only accessible via codes and hacking in various ways, thus how we know about it. That is, until the Insane Trilogy remaster, when it was released as free DLC. It looks, frankly, unbearable, so it's, it's a no from me. The meaning of life. The lovable floating mask Aku Aku, etc., is named after a restaurant according to an XNG employee, Dave Baggett. It was a Polynesian restaurant back in their home state of Boston, who apparently served fairly terrible food, to quote him. Wow, yikes. Number 43. Ironically, even though he's your friend, Aku means evil in Japanese, so maybe they should have called his evil twin that instead. Number 44. Crash doesn't exactly have a huge vocabulary, he mostly just says, Whoa! and Yeehaw! Andy Gavin stated that this was because him having an actual voice would be distracting and difficult for the player to identify with him. Number 45. Crash did eventually speak in 2007, where he said the word pancakes at the end of Crash of the Titans, and apparently people were not best pleased with that. So, oh. Number 46. That being said, he eventually spoke a heck of a lot more when he and Spyro started to make appearances in the Skylanders series. And in this, he has a... Australian accent? Sure, that makes sense, I guess, with Bandicoot, but... Number 47. If you 100% complete the first game, the player will get an alternate ending. Ooh. This, though, shows what happens to all the bad guys after you defeat them. For instance, Dr. Enbrio becomes a bartender again, and Papu Papu started a shop. Surprisingly wholesome. Number 48. And then in November of 1997, along came Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. With a new game came a new engine, Vroom Vroom. This one was three times faster than before, apparently, which meant Crash himself had 574 polygons and over 9,000 frames to animate, which was more than most other game characters at that time. Number 49. Production on Cortex Strikes Back began in October of 1996, just a month after the first game was released. It took around 13 months and had a bigger budget this time of $2 million. That's a lot of Wumpa, baby. Number 50. This new engine meant Crash had a fair few tricks up his sleeve. I mean, he doesn't have a sleeve, you know, metaphorically. But anyway, this time he can high jump, high spin jump, body slam and slide attack. Whereas before, he could merely dream of doing that. Number 51. If you take a look at Dr. N. Jin, you'll notice he's got a missile in his head, which must be, I mean, all kinds of inconvenient. It's still active too, so it must really smart. This was apparently inspired by Jason Rubin's own migraines, which, compared to a missile? Wow, that must have been horrible. Number 52. Now this game went on to become one of the best-selling PlayStation video games of all time, Wobble we were. It replaced its predecessor as the highest-selling Western title in Japan at the time too. It sold more than 800,000 copies there in just a mere matter of months. Number 53. As we mentioned earlier, Crash's girl was replaced by Sister Coco, although the relationship was changed. Yeah, it must have changed. She was created by Naughty Dog as a counterbalance to Torna, Crash's girlfriend, who Universal was never really comfortable with anyway. According to artist Charles M. Billis, Sony Computer Entertainment Japan weren't happy either with the idea of a super sexy character next to Crash. I mean, it is a bit weird. Number 54. So Crash nearly had an animation for his first game, but did get an actual manga for its sequel. It's... it's a lot, and Crash does more talking than in the games. Number 55. 
In the portal room outside the level bear rate, you can see a polar bear literally called Polar. Much like if you see a baby polar bear in real life, jump on its head. You'll get 10 extra lives for doing so, in the game that is, in reality you'll probably lose your only one. Number 56. And then in October of 1998 came Crash Bandicoot 3. Warped! Production of this game began in January of 1998, and no, I didn't read that wrong, they had nine and a half months to make this a monster of a game. Number 57. A way you can tell that you're progressing in this game, by the way, is noticing the time of day. The early levels in Warped are based in the daytime, later ones are in the nighttime. Look at that. Number 58. Bearing in mind they only had 10 months to make this game, just one month over creating a human, although that is harder to do, the team still managed to build three new engines. Two of them were for the airplane and jet ski levels, while another was specifically made for the motorcycle levels. Number 59. Apparently in said airplane level, they specifically programmed the enemy planes to never fire behind you, and always to try and veer in front of you first before shooting. This was to make the level seem a bit more arcadey and frankly a bit more fair. Number 60. Spyro the Dragon included a demo for Crash Bandicoot Warped, giving players a taste of the stage Tell No Tales. Warp then decided to scratch their backs too in response, giving them a demo accessible in the main menu by pressing a secret code. A, a code that was in the manual, so it wasn't that secret, but still. Number 61. Speaking of Spyro, remember when they teamed up? Me neither, but they did. In 2004, Vicarious Visions wanted to try something different with both of these respective titles, attempting a massive crossover event in the process. The results are Crash Bandicoot Purple, Ripto's Rampage, and Spyro Orange The Cortex Conspiracy, two connected titles for the Game Boy Advance. Number 62. Speaking of handheld stuff, let's have a show of hands. Who remembers the Pocket Station? Wow, no. Well, me neither. <laughs> what a little scamp I am. It was a device that allowed you to download mini-games that was only available in Japan. Well, Crash Bandicoot Wapped, sorry, too much Cardi B, I mean Warped, was one of the first games this worked with. It turned Crash into a Tamagotchi and gave you a game where you had to avoid walls. Number 63. In the underwater levels, there is, God forbid, a shark. Who'd have thought it? Well, this was one of the first things that Jason Rubin ever made using the power animated programs. However, it could not be utilised in the game until Warped. Nintendo 64. Pura was introduced in Warped in those levels where you ride her like she's a common ass on a beach. She was going to be a panda bear, believe it or not, but this was deemed too similar to Polar the Polar Bear, because they're both bears. Number 65. Warped also had those Arabian levels, and if they seem familiar, that's because they're very similar to the land of Agrabah from Disney's Aladdin. The enemies are even wearing similar things to both Jafar and Abu respectively, and there are magic carpets. I mean, come on. Number 66. But after Crash Bandicoot Warped came the daddy, Crash Team Racing, a bastion of childhood. For millennials, anyway. This game's engine was actually built around the same time as Warped was being made, which makes sense given the driving sections of those games. Number 67. Initially though, they developed the game without any Crash characters at all, and instead with generic characters with block heads. This was in case Universal and Sony didn't want another Crash game. However, they did, a deal was made, and the rest is rum rumming history. Number 68. Now obviously in the karting gaming world, one name looms large. That's right, Diddy Kong. To prove the game could actually work, they recreated a course from Diddy Kong Racing called Crescent Island to see if the PlayStation could take it. It could. Well done. Number 69. Wow! No, okay, I was kind of pulling a leg there. The big name for karts was Mario Kart, of course, and Naughty Dog knew that. They wanted to make sure that they were standing on the shoulders of giants with Mario, but they wanted to add unique twists, which is where things like boosting upon landing came from. Number 70. Weirdly enough, this mechanic was also inspired by the NFL. More specifically, it was inspired by a statistic that measured how long the ball was in the air for. The more time you're in the air in the game, the more boost you got when you landed, just like real life. Number 71. How's this for absolutely crazy? Development for racing took place over the course of eight months on a budget of $2.4 million by a team of just 16 to 18 staff. As in, number of people, not their ages. That would be really mental. Number 72. Fake Crash appears in Crash Team Racing as a playable character, but he actually appears way before this. For a start, he's sort of in the manga, but more specifically, he can be seen dancing in some of the levels in Crash Bandicoot Warped, only if you've got all the collectibles. Number 73. Penta Penguin is another character that first appeared in the manga, but then was available to be playable in Crash Team Racing, but only if you're a naughty little cheater. As a cheat character, Penta did happen to be a little bit on the uh, Vanellope von Schweetz side, if you get what I mean. Glitching everywhere. Number 74. 
The game's main villain, the fantastically named Nitrous Oxide, get it, is technically not playable and wouldn't be until a sequel. I say technically because through hacks and codes you can play as him, but it crashes the game, which is ironic, I guess. Number 75. Canonically, the plot of this game is, well, hard to explain. And that's not just about when it takes place, really, because Cortex, Entrophy, and Uka Uka are all in it, despite the fact at the end of Warp they turn into babies. So, hmm. Number 76. Some female bandicoots hand out the prizes in this game, which, I mean, let's hope that was ironic. But anyway, they're called Amy, Isabella, Liz, and Megumi, the Nitro Squad. They're named after some of the women who were involved in the Crash Bandicoot games. Number 77. This fact just makes me wish I lived in the past, because I yearn for this to still be the case. In 1999, if you bought a stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut, you'd get a free PS1 demo disc, which included Crash Team Racing as well as Ape Escape, Final Fantasy VIII, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, and Cool Borders 4. Oh my lord, take me back! Number 78. Next came the first game not to be made by the folks at Naughty Dog in the form of Crash Bash, which was made by Eurocom Entertainment Software and released in 2000. It was a party game that James Radar described as more four-player fun than even Ron Jeremy could offer, which, wow, that has not aged well. Number 79. Then a year later in 2001 came Crash's first foray onto the PS2 and other non-Sony consoles a year later, The Wrath of Cortex. Now apparently this was going to be a big free roaming game, but this was changed due to arguments behind the scenes, and it was given to Traveller's Tales instead. Number 80. This meant that Traveller's Tales then had to start the game all over again and had just 12 months to do it in. Could they do it? Well they did, so yes they could. Yay! Number 81. When creating the Triceratops chase sequences in the prehistoric levels, a minion of Dr. Cortex was initially animated riding the beast. Whenever the Triceratops got stuck, it would thrash the minion around. The rider was ultimately removed though for technical reasons. Number 82. Pyro is voiced by Mark Hamill, you know, Luke Skywalker and the Joker, marking the first celebrity voice role of a character in the Crash Bandicoot histoire. Although that's a bit harsh actually on Clancy Brown. Sorry Clancy Brown. Number 83. Also, fun fact for you here, Mark Hamill and Clancy Brown have worked together before as the Joker and Lex Luthor respectively in several shows in the DC Animated Universe, so they've got history. Number 84. Now, the next game in the series was going to be a game called Crash Bandicoot Evolution, which was going to be a platformer and RPG hybrid, which was described as edgy. Apparently, Ratchet and Clank at the time were going in a similar direction, so it was reworked into the much funnier Twin Sanity on the PS2 and Xbox in 2004. Number 85. You can play as Big Bad Head Dr. Cortex in this game, speaking of whom, do you know why the big N is there on his forehead? According to the production bible of the first game, it was tattooed there standing for nerd when he was three. <laughs> Who's a nerd at three? I mean, I could name all the Thomas the Tank Engine trains at that age, but that's not the point. Number 86. It's worth noting, by the way, that Cortex hints he killed Dingo Dial in Tag Team Racing, saying, I may choose out of Dingo Dial, which makes no sense because Dingo Dial is seen alive and well in later games. Maybe it's just a limb. Number 87. Also in Crash Tag Team Racing, Cortex hints he served during the Vietnam War at the Da Nang Air Base, which is... Uh, okay. Sure, fine. Number 88. Since then, there have been a number of other games in the main series of Crash and Beyond, including Crash of the Titans, Crash Mind of the Mutant, and the aforementioned Crash Tag Team Racing. Number 89. There was going to be a fourth main Crash title developed by Radical Entertainment called Crash Landed in 2010. The pun game is so, so strong in this series. Which was actually in development for a couple of years, but Activision pulled the plug on this and the game was cancelled. And so Crash and Co. remained dormant. For a bit. Number 90. Because then along came 2017, when Activision decided to put a new engine in the nostalgia train with a reboot of the first three games with Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, after a long hiatus for Crash and Co. Number 91. Even Gavin, who had long since left the series, said he would love to see a HD reboot one day of the first games he made, so it wouldn't be just like trampling all over the dreams of the creators. And so Crash and Co. came back with a brand new lick of paint. Number 92. And people dug that lick too, which is a horrible sentence I'll never say again. It got a Metacritic rating of 80, lovely stuff, and drove people absolutely insane everywhere with its really difficult challenges. Road to nowhere, I... hate you? Number 93. In fact, there was quite a bit of debate whether the game was hard or just straight up broken. Vicarious Visions actually did do a blog post about this, talking about how actually it was more forgiving than the original. Which ruffled a few feathers, let me tell ya. Number 94. 
The Japanese version of the stage The High Road, which is also brain-blowingly hard, is called Turtle Turtle Jump, which implies the player could use turtles to get through this mega mega hard level. Number 95. None of the voice actors who were featured in the original games reprised their roles for the Insane Trilogy. It was all the new kids from Twin Sanity and Tag Team Racing. Number 96. BT Dubs, by the way, the OG's Naughty Dog were referenced three times in the Insane Trilogy. First off, there's an asteroid bearing the Naughty Dog paw print that's been added during the introduction of Cortex's space station. Number 97. In the second one, Coco's computer screen at the opening part has a cutscene from Uncharted 4 A Thief's End on it. This is only in the PS4 version though, I assume for licensing reasons. Number 98. Finally, in the third, if you look carefully at a table in the Bandicoot house, there's a framed picture of Nathan Drake of Uncharted fame, which implies that they're... friends? Or family? Oh, that would have been a twist. Number 99. All the debates and new voice actors, though, had them laughing all the way to the bank as the Insane Trilogy was commercially very successful indeed. It sold 2.5 million copies in its first three months. Wow. Number 100, it's number 100. And it's because of this success that we are finally getting a direct sequel to Crash 3. It's about time, right? Called Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about to- oh, they already made the joke. Developers Toys for Bob will take the lead after assisting on the Insane Trilogy and Spyro Reignited Trilogy. Number 101. On September the 8th, 2020, an alternate reality version of Torna, Crash's love interest from the first Crash Bandicoot game, was announced as a playable character. And this time she's in suitable attire too, and looks more proportionally normal real 2020 vibes. So that was 101 facts about Crash Bandicoot. Is he your favourite gaming character in the world? Let me know in the comments down below. Also while you're down there, be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to 101 facts. I mean, ah, oh, what a team we've got here. It's such, it's such fun aboard this good ship. In the meantime though, hark, look, two glimmering gems of videos on screen for you right now that are going to make your life worth better. What? See what I mean by clicking on one, maybe. And I'll see you there. Goodbye.